David Sandom is an artist and author, notable for his highly praised 2015 book, I'll Run Till the Sun Goes Down, a memoir about depression and discovering art. But many of you will know him as the founder of Twitter Art Exhibit, an organization that exhibits postcard-sized artwork submitted by artists from all over the world. The donated artwork is sold to help raise money for charities and nonprofit organizations. I sincerely hope you enjoy this interview with David. David, welcome on board. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, to start off with, I know we're going to probably talk about Twitter art exhibit a lot in this video, um, but I want to talk more about you to start off with. Um, so my first question is, have you always been creative? Um, has, has creativity always been an important part of your life? Has um, artwork come naturally to you from childhood, or was that something you discovered later in life? Um, that's a great question. I, I think the answer to that is yes, I've always been creative. I've always been kind of in my own space. Um, since I was very young, I would sit in my room and draw alone for, for long periods of time. I loved to walk out in the woods and I remember we, there was a, a, you know, they have those career days in school where they want you to think about what you want to become in third grade. I remember all my friends um, were saying, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a policeman or a soldier or whatever. And uh, my answer was, I want to be a nature photographer. And that was, in, that was in third grade. So I've always been in that kind of space where I like to think about stuff and be out in nature and draw. And so I think that explains a lot. I love to go to art museums when I was a kid. You know, I would go into the art museums and, and look at famous paintings in Gothenburg in Sweden, where I grew up. And my mother would take me there. Uh, so we love to do that together. So that instilled in me from a very young age an interest in culture and art. And, um, so but I, I never really had a dream to become an artist or anything like that. I just appreciated art and I loved to draw, but I didn't go to art school or anything like that. Um, um, but when I went to college, you know, I, uh, that's later, I went to the university uh, in Utah, University of Utah. I lived in the U.S. for eight years and um, I had um, a minor in history. And I took several art history classes and had some wonderful professors. And that really opened up my eyes to, to understanding art better. And also took introduction to art and, you know, things like that. So I, when I had selective classes, I always took anything art related or culture related. And uh, of course, after I was done with the university, like my memoir talks about, then um, I, I started um going the, down that path full time yeah yeah that's that's really interesting um so like you know because you're you're a painter and um who are some of the artists that inspire you know your your style of, of work mm. you know that's that's a question i get a lot and um you know when you've been doing this full time for 20 years you sort of drift in and out of different inspirations so um, I would say in the early days, what inspired me the most was um, first uh, Edvard Munch, who is um, from this area where I live in Norway. Um, so Scandinavian art has always been uh, a big part of it, but Munch also inspired, you know, Van Gogh and, um, and that type of art has always been huge with me. Uh, colorists, you know, people who use color. Uh, Gauguin, Bonnard, um, I could I could sit here and talk about <laughs> different artists, but you know it, it, it goes in and out of different phases. You know what inspires, mm -hmm. but definitely anybody who uses color and and paints their life story and sort of has more of an expressive uh, view is what speaks to me the most. Uh, probably because I dealt with my depression and things like that uh, through art. Uh, artists who worked in a similar way uh, really appeals to me. Okay. And, you know, since you mentioned your book, even, um, so 
because that's a memoir. So you started writing that because it was released in 2015. But mm -hmm. um, obviously, you must have started writing that a lot earlier on. Um, yeah. Can you tell us when you started writing it and why? Yeah, I, I actually started writing it um, in the year 2000. So it was a 15 year project from when I started writing to when it was published. I would say the last, I mean, five years of that was just editing and finding a publisher and re-editing and you know that whole thing it takes a long time but uh, I started it mostly like a journal I didn't have a thought about making it a, into a book first I just would write down what I was going through in this huge document you know every time I would see a psychologist or every time I was uh, committed to hospital or you know things were happening I would write down dialogues, things that happened, things that I saw. So the book has a lot of detail that I could never have remembered if I sat down 15 years later and tried to re recap that. Uh, so each chapter starts with a journal entry and then it tells that story, what happened. So I just started, I just did it to um, put words on what I was going through. Everything was so chaotic. Um, I think that's the best way to say it almost like a journal just to make sense of stuff yeah 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 that's really interesting um something i like to ask about you know if you don't mind uh you know if you could share even a little bit about your story with you know uh going through depression um because you know in this day and age you know there's a there's a lot of weird stuff going on a lot of people are stressed out um a lot of people uh, are depressed and uh, you know they need some sort of uh, way of escape from that and um, I wanted to ask you know how you used art as a, uh, a mode of healing or therapy. Um, yeah I, I would use the word coping more than healing. Um, I think that's a consequence of the coping uh, but it's a way to endure uh, it's a way to, um, I would say, be cathartic about what you're experiencing. I think it's really helpful for anyone who struggles to be creative in some way. I don't think you have to use art that, like I do in painting or drawing or things like that. You could write. Um, you, you can uh, create music. You can dance. Uh, you know, anything where you are able to express what's inside. Uh, will help help you cope. So I, I see art as a coping mechanism rather than having the end goal of being healed. If I if I have a good day, you know, that's great. But I could also start to cry when I'm painting or go through very difficult things, or I can just work, you know, have something to do. It puts my mind in a different sphere than maybe focusing it on my suffering per se. Because when you start with a blank canvas, you sort of disappear into another world. And I think that's really important in coping. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the, these days are, are definitely uh, stressful for a lot of people. And, you know, they need to, you know, find some, some way of coping, some way of escape um, from the news. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, the news, for sure. <laughs> but... It's not really an escape either, because I think to create genuine art, you have to be honest and then you can't escape. You have to actually be bold and brave and face your feelings and fears. So it, it's anything but escape, really. It's actually being brave to face what you're feeling and, and that it's OK to do whatever is in you. If you want to paint a black picture, you can do that. You know, if you want to paint a sunny day, you can do that, too. There's there's no right or wrong with art, but in order for it to be genuine art, I think you have to be honest, whatever that emotion is. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, but definitely you mentioned the news. Um, it, it's really stressful. It's really hard. I, I've, I'm trying to avoid the news as much as possible these days. You have to keep up to date with the new rules and restrictions that's constantly changing and 
things like that. But if I sit and watch CNN all day long, I'm going to be depressed in like an hour. It's just, it's just too much. Uh, I'd rather sit and draw or listen to music. Music is really important to me too. Yeah. Um, yeah, very, very important. And I usually listen to music while I paint or draw. And, and it's really important that I find music that sort of correlates to what I'm feeling, sort of enhances what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm real about that. <laughs> Yeah, can you tell us what kind of music you like? Oh, okay. That's kind of like your first question. It goes, you know, I can listen to Mozart and classical music or opera one day, and I can listen to Nirvana the next day. There's really no uh, answer, but um, anything that has a genuine feeling to it. Uh, I pay a lot of attention to lyrics, too. Um, I like a lot of Bruce Springsteen. Um, it, it could be a lot. Sometimes I listen to jazz. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason. It's just the feeling that I have. But I have these playlists that I make. I used to burn CDs every, you know, back in the old days where, you know, you didn't have Spotify. It cost me a lot of money. I, I would burn a CD every day before I went to the studio. Uh, you know, what I wanted to listen to that day. And I had hundreds of these burned CDs, <laughs> you know, and when Spotify came in, it was, uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see here. Um, what else do I want to ask? Well, I guess we can talk a little bit about Twitter art exhibit now. Um, I guess I'm sure you probably explained the story a million times, but tell us how Twitter art exhibit began. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've told this so many times. I feel like a robot, but, um, it started in 2010 when I, um, read a newspaper article in my local paper that they had cut the funding for children's books for my local library. And, you know, back in the day, I mean, you were part of it. We were a close knit art community. Um, before Twitter came, before social media, I was alone uh, in my studio, probably for eight, 10 years. I didn't see very many people. I didn't share my work with too many. I had some friends that dropped by, but when social media came, I, I connected with artists in Australia and the US and England, all over the place. And we supported each other uh, and got to know each other and who we were. And a lot of us are still in contact. It became a close friendship um, to these people, these artists. And um, I had this idea that I wanted us to do something together. So I'd already started that thought process. But when this newspaper article came, I kind of put the two together that I have all these art friends on social media that I want to do something with, maybe exhibit with. And then I wanted to help this cause. How can I do that? And so I first thought about artists being able to send paintings to my library. But then I thought, oh, that's going to cost a lot of money. How do we do that? How do you curate something like that? Uh, and what do I do with unsold work? How do I send it back? You know, the cost of that would just be crazy. Most of my artist friends couldn't afford to ship a painting from Australia or something. So I looked at my, at my studio wall. I had all these postcards. I call it my wall of inspiration. Whenever I'd gone to an art museum or something like that, I'd buy a postcard and I would put it up on my wall and look at it every day, sort of my inspiration. And I thought to send a postcard, that doesn't cost a, a whole lot. You know, you just make something like that, postcard size, and put it in an envelope and... Uh, donate it uh, so I don't have to send it back <laughs> we donate it to the charity and so I asked my artist friends can you please support this um, and send hand-painted postcards to my library and I'll exhibit it and we'll send sell it for charity and uh, we got I think 220 cards from 24 countries and we raised enough money to buy 221 new children's books and that was fantastic um, so that's how it started and I didn't really think about doing it again. Uh, it was just a one-time project. So in 2011, I didn't do it. Um, I thought this was a, a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of communication, you know, what size should it be? Where should I send it? What address? I was writing to hundreds of people by email. I didn't have the organization that we have today. But um, in 2012, my local women's shelter also needed funding. And then I thought, oh, I'll do it again. But it, it was a local thing, you know, I did it for my community and we helped that women's shelter and that was great. But then 
then in 2013, I was uh, contacted by a curator in LA. Her name is Nat George. And she asked if she could do it in her city for a charity that she cared about in my name with the same idea. And that's sort of how Twitter Art Exhibit as an organization took root and that we sort of got a board together and uh, decided we would do one a year in a different city for a different charity. And we've done it ever since, many different parts of the world. It's grown. <laughs> we now have, you know, 1,200 artists from 64 countries. You know, it's gotten to be much bigger. That sort of recaps it, I think. But it's, it's not just about uh, what I, why I wanted to bring that in, the social media and the, you know, the close-knit community of artists we were is, it's not just about raising money for charity. It's also about us artists doing something creative together and that it's an all-inclusive project where anyone can participate, amateur and professional alike. And when you see all these cards on the wall together, it's really an installation. And it's fantastic to see all the different mediums and expressions. There's no theme that the artists have to follow. They can do whatever they want, any medium they want, as long as it's handmade and hand signed. And so you look at this wall, and there's just so many things to look at and see what country they're from and what city they're from. And the, the buyer can contact the artist and artists connect with other artists. And there's just so many good feel elements of this. Yeah, I love it. And, and you know, I mean, Twitter art exhibit, you know, I, I, I haven't ever seen anything else like it. You know, I can't find anything else like it. I want there to be something else like it, but there's nothing else out there. <laughs> there's a lot of these kinds of projects that have popped up. Postcard art is his own hashtag now. I see that. Um, but there, there's really no project like Twitter art exhibit that's at the scale that it is and has the history that it has and that is as inclusive and also that we donate the funds to the charities there's really no personal gain involved everybody's doing it to help someone help a charity so I we're definitely unique and I think we were the first um, but there's definitely been other projects that pop up most of them are just for a year or for one single thing and then they sort of die out. We do it every year. Um, yeah. Routinely. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. All right. Let me see here. All right. Well, let's see. Can you tell us a bit about this year's Twitter art exhibit? Um, what organization is being helped and uh, when it's going to have the exhibits and the sale? Yeah. Well, this year uh, has been crazy due to the pandemic. You know, it started uh, right when we were going to have last year's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And we had to do that mostly as an online event because there were restrictions on how many could go into the gallery and things like that. So Twitter Art Exhibit has two components. It's the actual opening exhibit. That's an event. You know, I usually come and open the exhibit. There are hundreds of people there. We may have music. When we were in Edinburgh in 2018, we had pipers and bagpipes and kilts and, you know, we, we, we had uh, the mayor open it there and stuff like that. So, so or the MP, I mean, so um, there's usually a show associated with it. And then there's an the online sale. Whatever doesn't sell at the opening then opens up to online and anybody can buy the cards. Um, this year, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to have that kind of shebang, that actual show, um, but it's planned to be in Cheltenham, England this year. Uh, we first were going to have it in May, but we now postponed it to July because of the restrictions of the pandemic. Uh, they don't see that lightening up until July. So we'll see when July comes, if we have to just do it strictly online or you know what's going to happen or if we can do it in some other way, um, but it's for Link, which is a leukemia charity. And I feel very strongly for this one because my sister-in-law has leukemia, been struggling with that for five years. And I've seen how difficult that is to have the bone marrow transplants, you know, what it does to the families. I felt that firsthand. So, uh, you know, we're gonna help Link that not only supports patients going through treatment with leukemia, but also supports their families 
And I asked Link to find a little, a narrow angle to what our money will go to. You know, I don't just like to put it in the pot and see it sort of evaporate into all kinds of costs. I like to support a more detailed project or we, I should say on the board. So we are gonna support uh, therapy. Uh, so each card that sells is gonna be one therapy session for a leukemia patient or one of their family members. And that's very, very important. And especially now with the pandemic, you can imagine what they go through with treatments and the fear that they have of, of getting the virus. I mean, it would kill them. They don't have any immune system. So it's been a heavy strain for them and they need someone to talk to about these things. So we'll do important work there for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Well, do you have any other upcoming plans or anything you want to do with Twitter art exhibit in the future? Any like different avenues you want to take it? Um, that's a good question. You know, we want to grow, of course, we you want to evolve, but I don't want to grow too much. I don't want to change too much. I don't want it to change into something else. I've always seen this as kind of an underground organization. You know, we, we've not been supported by any big, you know, funding or this or that. It's just us artists doing what we can. The concept is simple. The artists create a card, send it in each year. We support a charity and then we move on to the next. Um, and I like that simplicity of that. I don't want to turn into, oh, well, let's do five a year. Let's do it bigger. Let's get 5,000 cards. You know, I like the way it is and we're doing good. So... My biggest challenge is as we're growing um, to also sustain us because we donate pretty much everything to the charities. We also need uh, to cover our own overhead. There's a lot of work that goes into creating our catalog, uh, paying for our website, you know, uh, MailChimp and Dropbox. And, you know, the costs are mounting. And as we get more and more participant, we need bigger and bigger Dropbox, bigger and bigger this. So we need to have some money coming into us also and that's my biggest challenge is to make us survive um long term as well cover our costs for travel so that we we don't get too stressed because we do a lot of hard work with this uh, us on the board and uh, we need to be able to relax a bit too so if you buy a catalog for instance that supports us and that's really important to cover our own costs so i'm kind of in that mindset to make things sustainable for years to come and we're doing good. I'm not worried, yeah. But I still see us as kind of an underground thing, you know, it's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I wanted to do this interview to, you know, help spread more awareness on Twitter art because of it. I, I assume you guys always could use more awareness Oh, don't take me wrong. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I want, I want, it's not like I don't want people to know about what we're doing. I just say, I don't have this goal that we need to get 10,000 cards or make this into some humongous thing. I just, we've been doing this for 10, yeah. 11 years and it's, it's great. Yeah. I originally wanted to do this interview when um, submissions were still being taken in, but then it was like, oh, it came and went and, you know, yeah. but I thought, Hey, you know, more awareness, you know, let's do the interview now. Why not? Sure. But, and yeah. you asked what other projects and things, and, you know, I have to work with several work groups at the same time because when the opening happens in Cheltenham, I will announce next year's venue. That means that I've had, I have to have the location in place, the curator in place, the work group has to be trained and the charity has to be selected already by the time that one opens. So I always work, you know, with future projects, you know, where's it going to be in 2022? Where's it going to be in 23? Yeah. You know, I have to work with several uh, Twitter art exhibits at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I noticed that, yeah, every every year on the date of the event, uh, you do announce the next one, so. Yeah, and that's been sort of a tradition. Our artists always look forward to my opening speech because where's it gonna be next year? There's that excitement, you know. Oh, something up there, I gotta close that. Uh, so I get the screen back. Okay, there you are. Uh, so uh, it's fun, and um, yeah. I can tell you, uh, where's it gonna, I can't tell you where it's gonna be. Because <laughs> Price element. 
I almost slipped there, but uh, <laughs> I can tell you it's going to be in Europe again at a really fun place. Okay. So, um, we've been in Australia, we've been in the US, we've been in Scotland, England, you know, now we'll go to another European major city. And hopefully a lot of our participating artists will be able to travel into that one. That's one of the things I noticed in Edinburgh when it was there in Scotland in 2018 was there, there were so many participating artists traveling in to be part of the event at the opening. And that was like a reunion. It was fantastic. Just like I'm seeing you now, I've, see, I've seen your card, you know, Sacred Elements, but I don't know what's, you know, what's the person behind that account. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it, it, I know the name. I know the cards they sent in, but I can't put an, a face to the name. So it's great at the opening to be able to meet many of the artists and they make a little vacation out of it, you know, and uh, that's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, I know you once did a Twitter art exhibit in uh, Orlando, which we almost went there, you know, because we're in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. But never got never got to do that. Could have could have met you a lot sooner, but yeah got around to doing that orlando was fantastic that's one of my favorite twitter art exhibits because we supported uh the center for contemporary dance which helped um children with downs and autism for dance education and to be part of that and see those kids dance and perform at the opening i have a brother with down syndrome so it was very special for me to be there and support that cause that's yeah. a great memory. So Florida was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Which that, that, that was one of my uh, final questions too. Um, I know you've probably been asked this question as well, um, but what was one of your favorite memories from a Twitter art exhibit? Unless the one you just mentioned is that one. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, every year is a good memory um, and they're special in different ways, but I would have to say that one in Orlando, seeing those kids uh, dance and give me a high five and a hug afterwards. Uh, it was just fantastic. Uh, but you know, gosh, I've got so many great memories. Um, one of the advantages I have is I get to see the charities up close and meet with them each year. The participating artists don't really get that experience to the same extent. I think that's something we can do better is communicate what the money actually goes to. We, we, we often been so busy that when one Twitter exhibit ends, we have to move on to the next. And I want to focus more on that to sort of share those experiences and see, see the difference that we're actually making in real people's lives. So I, I would say every year is a great memory, but never going to forget those kids dance there and give me those high fives and hugs, those Down syndrome kids and autism. They, they were just fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. Yeah, that's a that's a beautiful story. Um, well, let's see how long have we been going on here? Thirty minutes, hmm, not bad. I do want to keep these. Uh, I plan on doing a lot of interviews with um, different artists, uh, filmmakers, storytellers, musicians, authors, you name it. Um, but I want to keep the interviews, you know, around thirty minutes, uh, so then you know people can just sit down, watch it in one sitting. I think. You know, in this day and age, a lot of people don't have time for, you know, two hours of, you know, interview, um, unless it's cut down and trimmed down and, you know, um, you know, made in more of a digestible uh, bite. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, I guess as, you know, some final uh, few thoughts here, um, I definitely would like to have you back again. Uh, perhaps in the future when Tay 22 comes around. I think that would be uh, fun when submissions are, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, open. Um, and who knows, maybe these podcast type things I'll do, maybe I'll make them audio available as like downloads in the future, something like that. Who knows? I, I haven't fully decided how I'm uh, truly, you know, uh, going to share these videos. I know on Instagram and I'll see about other places. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. I guess as one final question, you know, I asked you who inspires you as an artist, but you know, who inspires you as a person? Wow. What a big question. Um, the first person that pops into my head is Nelson Mandela. Uh, 
I don't know why, but he's always been so inspirational to me. I think his endurance and tenacity, when he sat in that cell, you know, for all those years, that he still was able to keep his hope up and what he was able to accomplish. Um, I don't know. There's just something about him that always inspires me. So I think that that's the first thing that comes to mind. I could probably mention tons and tons of people. Maybe tonight when I lay in bed, I'll say, oh, why didn't I say that? But Nelson Mandela was just, I, I can't un understand almost where he got his strength from. So when I go through difficult times and uh, I think life is tough, I think of him in that cell and that he, he was able to go on day in, day out and still have a vision that inner strength that really inspires me. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, well, David, uh, where can people find you? Well, um, just Google David Sandham, but um, I, have a, I have a website, but social media, I'm on Twitter, David Sandham, um, Instagram, all that stuff, Facebook. Yeah, and, you, and your book? My book, you can find that on Amazon. It's uh, available as a hard copy and as an ebook. Uh, so just type David Sandham on Amazon or I'll rent till the sun goes down and my book will come up. So uh, I love to connect with readers. So if they want to send me a message and I'll, I'll respond to them personally and talk to them about their experience. Did you read the book? <laughs> uh, no, I have not. <laughs> Being honest, but yeah, I, I, I will definitely check it out at some point. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything, David. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely, I would like to have you back on again, perhaps maybe for K 2022. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's everything. I, I had a good time with this conversation and this was my first interview, at least interviewing someone else. You know, uh, I have been interviewed by other people before, but never was I the actual host. <laughs> well, you done good. You did great. You had good questions and you have a good presence and uh, I think you'll do great as a podcast. Oh, thank you. Yes, so thank good luck you. with that. And I'll be happy to come back. Um, just send me a note. All right. Well, thank you, David. This was great. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good day. Greetings from Norway. Bye-bye. <laughs>